This session is called Anti-Fragile, which uh, for many of you means you already know what it's about. For others, uh, you might just think we're making up words. Um, we didn't make up this word. I believe it has been popularized by Talib. Have I, have I got that right? Anyway, I, I learned of it uh, through this a wonderful book called The Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff, um, which which looks into that, that book as well as the underlying idea of anti-fragility, looks into this, uh, this idea that people need to be constantly protected from risk and the consequences from that. The idea is a, a fragile thing, when it's stressed, it breaks. A resilient thing, when it's stressed, it doesn't break. An anti-fragile thing, when it's stressed, it improves, it gets better. And so the argument goes, and I think uh, it's quite a good argument, humans, for the most part, are anti-fragile. When we're stressed, we improve. Not maybe in that moment, <laughs> but over time, learning to deal with stress can help us to become better people. And what does that mean if we take away that stress, if you take away the risk, if you take away the challenge of life? If it is the stress, the challenge, the risks of life that help us evolve into be better people, what happens if you take away those stresses, risks, and challenges of life? It's not immediately clear that we're going to get better people. So broadly speaking, this is the topic of anti-fragile, and we have some excellent speakers to speak to us about this topic today. First up is someone who uh, every year when we're going through the conference, at some point we say, it doesn't matter if we don't have a topic, we just have to sneak Anthony Dillon in there somewhere. <laughs> he has to be on the stage. Uh, so anyway, please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Anthony Dillon. Uh, so my presentation is going to be uh, as John spoke about, but also perhaps a little bit tangential. Um, this was in the paper recently, um, so I think it sums up. I'll give you a moment to digest that. Okay, okay, it's funny, but it's not funny because it's that's what happens. Okay, um, you know we hear the term snowflake and. Uh, it, we, live in that, we live in a world of snowflakes. We're surrounded by snowflakes. Uh, how many have got snowflakes in their families? Yeah. yeah. Any snowflakes here today? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I want to distinguish between, like we, we speak about fragility. We often think that resilience is the solution or the opposite of it. So re resilience is a good thing, but it's not exactly the opposite of fragility the way I see it. Um, so, for example, if you know someone, a kid walked past me and said, "You're ugly," it wouldn't worry me. It's not because I'm resilient. I mean, it's just I really don't pay much attention. I don't care about that kid's opinion of me. So that's not being resilient. It's just having what I call a better understanding of what's happening. So more about that shortly. So bodies are very different to minds, and I use I say that because. People who, you know, the snowflakes will tell you, well, you know, just as your body can get hurt, so too can your feelings get hurt. You know, if I stuck a needle into you, Anthony, that would hurt you. Yes, it would. My body, assuming my nervous system is functioning properly, would not enjoy the needle being stuck into me. However, um, bad news or a joke or a naughty cartoon or whatever does not affect your mind the same way that a needle being stuck into you affects you. That's why two people can hear the same joke. One can laugh, the other can cry. It's not the joke that brings about the uh, response. Our mental well-being is defined by our re response to the world, not the actual events themselves in the world. We typically think of a, a negative response is associated with fragility. So when the person has a negative response to something, um, we call them fragile. And when they have a positive response, they're well adjusted. So two people get fired from work. One is devastated. The other thinks, look, this is not what I ch would have liked, but uh, I see it as an opportunity. Okay. So one is well adjusted. The other is fragile. Coming back to ex the example I used a minute ago, y you get called a, a name. Uh, one says, you, you've hurt my feelings, this is terrible, I'm devastated, I'm going to sue you. The other person can just laugh and say, well, thank you very much for your opinion. Okay. A positive response is associated with better perception, unconditional self-acceptance, and less so with resilience. I'm not saying resilience is bad, I'm just saying uh, it's not the big factor here. 
um, that makes that toughens us up, uh, that makes us anti-fragile. Um, so with perception, when we see things as they really are, uh, and I, I get to talk around the place on bullying and, and other similar topics, and my advice to people who are the targets of bullying is if you change your perceptions of, of things and just understand that, that the bully is simply giving his or her opinion of you. It is simply that, his or her opinion. You have your own opinion of you, they have their opinion of you. And I'll talk about, I'll show a slide shortly. Once you value your opinion of you more than other people's opinion of you, well then you're no longer a, a victim. It's not so much that you're resilient, you just have a better understanding of what's happening. So let's take a, a step back. Um, and we need to ask ourselves some serious questions. To what degree do you make other people's opinion about you more important, more important than your opinion about you? So we've had, um, you know, we've had the fight recently, Labor and Liberal calling each other names, and uh, one group seems to be more upset than the other. Um, but even when you are, up, whichever team you're on, if you're upset because of people uh, calling your names, uh, yeah, I would say toughen up, but also give you this advice, you can toughen up by realising that it is simply just the other person's opinion of you. What about your opinion of you? Maybe you're upset because, not because they're calling you names, but because you actually agree with them. Maybe deep down, they are simply validating what you already believe. Okay. So therefore, we've got to base our sense of self-worth on my opinion of me, our, our own opinion of ourselves. So it doesn't mean we don't, um, we're not grateful for feedback from others. It's always good to receive feedback, but we shouldn't base our sense of self-worth on other people's opinions of us. Um, let me tell you a very quick story. Um, I think it's one we can all relate to, and I've told it before at this conference. You have a young child in the shopping center with uh, his mother, we'll say it's a boy. The, the little two-year-old wants a lolly, the mother says no. The boy throws a tantrum, starts crying. The mother's starting to feel a little bit embarrassed. People are watching, staring. The kid cries even more. Uh, what does the mother often do? She grabs the lolly, gives it to the kid, and it's seen as a win-win situation. It's actually a lose-lose situation. But in the short term, it's a win-win situation. The kid's quiet, the mother's avoided being uh, seen as being a bad parent. What does that child learn? Next time the boy wants a lolly, what's he got to do? Throw a tantrum. Yes? The kid grows up, the tantrums become more sophisticated. And one of the very common tantrums to use is, you hurt my feelings, you upset me. And when a person says that, you're meant to apologize, you're meant to bow, you're meant to seek forgiveness. So the fragility, the long face, the temper tantrums, uh, whatever you want to call it, is simply a learnt response to manipulate others to get them to do things your way. Okay. Very important question. What happens when I tiptoe around other people's fragi fragility? What happens when the mother is afraid to not give the kid a chocolate? Okay. What happens when that boy grows up um, and the people he works with, or his partner, or his children, or whatever, are afraid to say no, are afraid to express a counter opinion. Um, have you helped that person? Not really, it's good for people to hear no. Um, in fact, one of the best words for children, uh, children in this day and age need a good dose of vitamin N. They need to hear that word no more often. And the, the word needs to be given without any feelings of guilt. Just a simple no, because I said so. As simple as that. Um, Instead, kids seem to get, um, you know, the Xbox and um, uh, medications and all that sort of thing simply because we've relaxed or compromised our use of vitamin N. Okay. Um, I often, in presentations like this, I'll give you a minute to... Um, Callum, this resonates with you, mate. 
Um, and who knows Callum? Callum's the ugly one sitting next to the beautiful woman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in presentations like this, uh, I've been doing it for a few years now, and I usually talk about Bill Leake or present one of his cartoons, not because he's left us, because um, they were always so relevant to the sorts of things I talk about. So um, it is a way of me giving a, an honour to our great mate, Bill Leake. But the cartoon speaks for itself. You've got a judge there. Um, people see the signs and they sometimes miss seeing that it's, you know, legal people, legal eagles there, the judge. Because we know that we live in an age where someone just has to say, you've hurt my feelings, I'm upset, how could you do this to me, how could you say that, and you, and you could end up in court. Okay? It's become that serious. Um, so this is what happens when you reward that inappropriate behaviour, when you reward any behaviour, uh, behaviour rewarded is behaviour reinforced. Okay? So you're not doing anyone a favour, you're not doing the little kid a favour when you give him the lolly. You're not uh, doing anyone a favour when you tiptoe around them. Uh, from a very early young age, I've told this story before, um, my daughter learnt when she threw a tantrum, it, it didn't work. I used to say, darling, is that the loudest you can cry? Cry really loud for me. Cry so everyone can hear you. She gave it up very quickly and she's a great kid. Um, today. Now often in presentations like this I, um, I'm expected or asked to talk about Aboriginal issues, um, so I thought I would um, just give an application to what we're talking about to Aboriginal issues simply because it's, it's expected and there's also good value, in, oh there's good value in itself I think, um, because I, as I keep saying, as I've said many times before here, Aboriginal affairs is everyone's business. Okay? So every white person here has just as much right as I do, or Warren Mundine, or just Enterprise, and they would agree with me, you have just as much right to talk about Aboriginal affairs as what they do as well. But, oh, thank you. Uh, um, but keep it, if that's all you got, just keep it. Uh, and, um, you know, I think this is going to be a, a relevant, well, it's always relevant, but... Um, We've got the, the ministers are going to be announced very soon and there may or may not be an Aboriginal minister. Um, and if, if there is, that's great, because it would probably be Ken White, who I think is a good fellow. Uh, and if it's not, you're going to have all the blacktivists yelling out, saying, you know, we don't have a voice. Well, you do have a voice. Um, anyway, back on topic. So one of the things that these blacktivists are upset about, what are they fragile about? Australia Day. We are without a voice. No, you're not. Um, well, if you see yourself as us and them, well then yes, you're without a voice. But if it's just us, well then you do have a voice. A claim I hear very often, racism runs so deep in this country. No, it doesn't. The wish that it does runs deep, but the actual real racism doesn't. Okay, That's not to say that, that there's not racism. Um, but it's not as deep as what they would have us believe. Australia's a pretty good country. Even in 2019, there's cries that the Aboriginal people are uh, suffering from colonisation. So here in, in this group, we see a lot of fragility. Fortunately, we see many, many good voices, uh, strong people, I've already mentioned them. We had a keynote speaker the other night, one of the strongest voices, um, who are showing you that with Aboriginal people, you don't have to tiptoe around them. Having said that, um, use discretion, and sometimes it's best, yeah, just shut up, you know, just let, let it go. If you're at a conference or at a university or whatever, and the, you know, the local elder tells you how terrible colonisation is, whatever, use your wisdom and just ask yourself, you know, is it worth challenging this person? It might be best just to shut up and move on. Um, but my advice in general, not just for Aboriginal issues, but for any issue, don't tiptoe around it if you feel very strongly about it. If you get told you've hurt my feelings, just let the person know that, no, I haven't hurt your feelings, you've hurt your feelings yourself. That's a, for them to say, you've hurt my feelings, you're responsible for it, you've caused my feelings to be hurt, I've got no power over them whatsoever, it's a bit like me saying, um, I, I put on weight because I just can't resist going to McDonald's, it's, it just 
sucks me in, I've got no power, I've got no control, it's McDonald's fault, so I'm going to sue them. Okay? Or I grabbed that young lady because she was so beautiful, I had no choice, she caused it. She caused the lust of me. Absolute nonsense. We do have control, uh, we're not fragile. We, uh, for far too long, we live in a society, we, you know, section 18, etc., etc., where we have been taught the myth that people are fragile and delicate and we've got to tiptoe around them, and that helps nobody. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks very much, uh, John, for that intro. And, and thanks to Tim Andrews and the team for this uh, wonderful conference. It's got a real sort of dynamism and, uh, an energy, this conference, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of it and to speak to all of you. So as John was alluding to, I'm a psychiatrist, um, and um, I wrote a book called Fragile Nation, which I spoke a bit about a couple of years ago. So some of, some of it may be familiar to those of you who were here a couple of years ago but I'll, I'll certainly update it um, for the times. Um, well, you heard that the term anti-fragile, and you heard from Anthony Dillon, uh, that's really from Nassim Taleb, but looking at the varieties of uh, what makes something systems or people, biological systems or financial systems, what, what makes them uh, robust. So I'll allude to that at a, at a very much more sort of um, psychological and uh, biological level too to um, uh, human beings. Now look, I just want to start with some broad themes really that will, that will go uh, overlap with some of what we heard in the morning. Now my, uh, my observation that will certainly overlap with a libertarian conference is that both sides of liberalism, so let's say economic on the right, social on the left, have been tremendously successful. So the rise in prosperity across the world is historically unprecedented. I know everyone in this room will rightly celebrate that. Now, likewise, the greater freedoms and opportunities for people of all ilks is extraordinary. Both have in, co co in common a celebration of individual choice and fulfillment of desire. Now, arguably, they have a degree of ambivalence to collective attachment and human association. So in some ways, I want to today the issues I will talk about will overlap with that comment. So I want to talk about couple of issues that overlap with my work. I work primarily in sort of outer metropolitan areas and I also fly to the regions. So that, uh, that has you know, considerable theme, overlapping themes with many of our political issues today. I want to talk about suicide, why mental health and its political implications are more significant for politics today. And I also want to touch on a trend I see in my work and we heard in the morning, Sam Crosby alluded to Mark Latham, he's also alluded to it, just this trend of white flight as well. It's something I see and I think it touches on uh, some of these themes. So all of these are, are linked to the challenge of retaining attachments and uh, belonging. Now I also want to touch on uh, just Sam Cro Tom Switzer and Sam Crosby's um, um, uh, session. Now I would argue whilst on one level the verbal fisticuffs, if you like, in the election campaign was, was, was a lot about tax and it was a lot about economics. I would argue at a more primitive level there was something more. And this is where I do think there are some overlaps with what happened in, in the United States with Trump. One of the most interesting analysis I saw of the Trump, and I saw it months later, but it was written weeks later, was by a Russian uh, philosopher. His name is Mikhail Remezov. And uh, not something someone I'd heard before, but apparently he's quite influential with uh, sort of Putin. But he's, he came out, uh, he, he argued that the Trump election was in part a reversion to the religious idea of man. So that's not just about, say, religious groups supporting, which certainly occurred in our most recent election. It was more really an idea of human nature. So it was a reversion to this idea of man essentially is embodied community, family, community, tradition, and in some ways a step away from what we may have celebrated through half a century of the liberalism. So I think that's a very pertinent comment. And I think in our election, there was an element of that. Whereas the overlay, the superficialities of it were about tax, etc. I think at a primitive level, what Morrison was projecting was a, mu was a much more a, a religious idea of man. You'd see him in prayer, you'd see this real kind of ties to family, community, tradition. And I think that is a key area that there was some overlap 
with the Trump election, a religious idea of man. Now, uh, away from that, I, I think some of the themes of my book are about why mental health has become a much, occupies a much bigger place in Western societies and, and politics in general. Now, some of you may have seen in Theresa May's speech uh, of resignation just recently, she actually identified uh, mental health as one of her key um, achievements, sort of achieving more funding in it. And the UK was actually one of the first, uh, it was the first country to appoint a minister of loneliness. So this is, I think it touches on that a lot of the big problems in modern societies, be it breakdown in families, rising depression, loneliness, suicide, unfulfilling jobs, they don't necessarily have ready-made sort of left-right political answers. Um, uh, and that's why traditionally, in I think in, in modern politics, A, a lot of people don't necessarily see what politics can do for them. Uh, I think the modern climate is by its nature therapeutic. Um, people yearn for sort of salvation through well-being, health, psychic security, and that's something I see in my work. Um, but beyond that, the, there's been a whole rise in the discourse in mental health, but I think it has great political implications, and that's, that's something I want to touch on. So why is it that, as a psychiatrist, I see people with serious mental illness? So why is it that this has grown significantly, both in the discourse and statistically? So uh, certainly the most obvious one is the decline in collective ties, so be it the decline of traditional religion, be it the decline of other collective attachments, be it family, church, unions, you name it, all of those groups have declined. So people have to process distress much more as individuals. Another, with the decline in religion comes a big decline in moral language. And this is something I see a lot in my work, where a lot of mental is actually about moral conflict. And I often tell a funny story where one of my first patients I saw, I used to fly to the town of Armadale. I remember one of the first patients I saw, he came in and he had this funny GP letter and the GP had said, oh, he wants you to talk to him about some personal issues, which you know, didn't seem, there was very little detail. And then it turned out he says, his problem was, doctor, I'm having too many affairs. I don't know what to do about it. So there you go, this is a, a completely, what would, what would certainly in the past be seen as an utterly moral question. He's seeing it through a medical lens, and, and you know, some, could, some would say that it's, uh, it's quite convenient for him. Um, but, but at the same time, I think it does show some, some real trends that uh, increasingly we lack a moral language. Uh, and in the United States, they've actually done studies on college students where they've asked them to solve problems with a moral dimension. And increasingly they're find, finding as generations of uh, the younger generations struggle to even have a language for it. So for example, I often talk about, say half a century may have talked about people's characters, but increasingly we will talk about people's personalities. It shows this a decline of a sort of moral um, uh, kind of valence to, to discussion about people. So the, I also think that's a major factor in the rise in mental health discussion, that increasingly people don't even have the language to talk about uh, moral or metaphysical issues and they'll often reach to the language of mental health. So a lot of my, uh, a lot of my day is really seeing people who either talk about their lives through the language of, say, self-fulfillment or psychology, or they come from traditions, say ethnic groups particularly, they will come from traditions where man has always been conceived through, through the lens of family, clan, tradition, but suddenly they're in the urban west, say living alone in flat, or they're in arranged marriage, or whatever you find, the first, second generation immigrants, and they're in a society where they feel a degree of distress, and they feel like this is the outlet this is the way they must speak about it. So often I'm meeting people who are going through this transition of seeing themselves previously as in a certain way and communicating about their lives in a certain way, but now kind of being, if not forced, feeling like, okay, now I need to talk about it in this modern language of psychology. And uh, I think that's, that's a very interesting um, trend that's, that, that's going on. Now, another really important point that overlaps strongly with this idea of resilience uh, and that Anthony touched on, uh, and it's a very important trend that, uh, uh, that John too alluded to and Jonathan Haidt um, has written about uh, particularly well, is this idea of concept creep. And in fact, the, f the founder of that term is an Australian uh, psychologist, Nick Haslam, his name is, and it's been used wi widely. This is the idea that we have diluted the measures of particularly of harm. So be it trauma, be it 
bullying, be it addiction, be it uh, you know, sexual harassment, all of the measurements of these terms have steadily declined. And Anthony alluded to bullying, and that's, that we can use that as an example. So when bullying was first defined, uh, the idea was it was something re repetitive, intentional, and there was an objective measure of harm to, say, to the victim. Where steadily now, it's increasingly become far more subjective measure, and increasingly there's been an elevation of perceptions. So individual perceptions are given far greater value. So there's a, there's a growth in subjectivity in, in our discourse, and that explains, I, I think, that's a big contributor to what can feel like, the, say, much more snowflakes um, in, the, in the public discourse. And, and I often, in my book, I won't go into great detail here, and I do uh, write a longer essay in the Friedman Papers, I think one of the great contributors to this is the, is the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, which came about in the Vietnam War. And it came about almost entirely due to the politics. Prior to that, people in the army who'd um, uh, suffered symptoms were generally seen to have their own innate vulnerability and it was tipped over by, say, something uh, life-threatening, et cetera. But they were a very tiny minority. They were a relatively small minority. What Vietnam did, because it was sort of the first war seen as where the, people, the veterans didn't come back as heroes, it was seen as a terrible war, there was a big movement to essentially come up with a diagnosis almost as a service to the veterans, uh, and it was highly successful. And the big change there was that the cause was no longer individual vulnerabilities, but it was the external trauma. And this happened in the 70s, and uh, it was uh, included in the psychiatric sort of manuals in 81. But I think over the last few decades, that very concept, that the cause is external, that uh, my feeling of pain and distress, uh, my subjective feeling of pain and distress, uh, carries a kind of truth, an automatic truth, uh, and, the ex and the cause is primarily external, I think that came about through the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, but has filtered throughout, all, throughout our culture. So it has elevated uh, the importance of subjectivity and perceptions, and it's also elevated the idea that the cause is primarily external. And, and this is especially the case um, in, in, say, the left, left side of politics. So I think that's a very, um, it's a very important uh, trend that's happened in, um, in, in recent decades. So those three, the combination of the decline in collective attachment, associated decline in moral language, the growth in the language of psychology and self-fulfillment to explain our lives, and finally, concept creep, the steady dilution in how we define these terms, I think they're kind of the critical elements why there's been a big growth in this discussion of mental health, both in health circles, but also in our politics. Both governments this election were competing over, over funding for mental health. So uh, whenever you hear the term mental health, take it, not necessarily, I don't necessarily mean uh, disregard it, but it's a term that is acquiring a much bigger mantle, and it's partly because we're losing the language to discuss a whole range of things. Increasingly, it's the way people conceptualise suffering because they're lacking a language to talk about it in other ways. Um, so with that in mind, I think that's where mental health has wider implications because it informs our view of human nature, uh, especially the limits of our resilience, free will, nature of responsibility. Its de dis definitions also carry importance in the disability and legal sectors. And I would argue, certainly from my point of view, and, and partly what interests me greatly about politics, the big disruptions we're having across the world, especially the Western world in politics, underneath it, because of the traditional authority, be it you know, religion, church, all the institutions of trust and authority are, are in decay or they're contested. Almost everything is contested at the moment. Underneath it all, I would argue to you, are deeper ideas of what constitutes human nature. And that's really what the, polit that's what the, the big political debates at a primitive level are often about. And I think that's potentially a challenge to libertarians, because I think underneath liberalism is an idea that the essence of man is kind of freedom personified and self-fulfillment and self-definition. 
Now, there's truth in all of those, all the different elements uh, of politics about what human nature constitutes. But I think some of the blowback we're seeing are reversions to a more traditional ideas of, of human nature. Um, I think suicide too. So, oh, shit. Okay, sorry. The stop sign's gone. <laughs> all right, okay. I think I've, I've completely underestimated the time. But look, there might be more time in the, in the, in the questions. Suicide, I think, highlights the limits of liberalism. It's the dark end point of the prioritization of individual autonomy, and it potentially exposes the weakness of a political system that doesn't really constitute guidance about what constitutes a good life, nor does it provide a strong basis for collective purpose, leaving a gap to be filled by the politics of dignity and identity. And I think that's one of the big uh, challenges for Western societies. Can we build a stronger sense of collective identity and collective purpose when we've essentially had half a century, very successfully, of the two liberalisms that have prioritised individual autonomy, but deprioritised collective attachment? I'll stop it there. Um, well, it's lovely to be here. Thank you. Um, it's I've come to, I think this is my third conference, and there's a f few times I've heard authors saying, you know, libertarians don't buy enough political books. And that may be so, but I do know that libertarians do want good books for their children. And so political books or blatant political books for children used to be taboo, but not anymore. So, we go all right? Oh, so blatant political books for children used to be taboo, but not anymore. And it's quite interesting, kind of referring back to my other panelists, the language that is now coming through in the children's books and the quality um, in terms of getting children ready for the adult world is currently at an all-time low. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today and about the way our li libraries are dealing with this. And so, one moment, where's my... Presentation. Yeah, no, there's nothing up there. No, I'm asking him to. Oh. There's nothing up there. Sorry about this. There's nothing there. Just close it. I've already used up all my jokes. <laughs> Where is it? I'm going to continue your speech now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's right. That's all right. Can we get the first page? Oh. So it's just not open. I can't see it. Yeah. I need to see it. You can just look to your right. Okay. I don't even see my There we go. Sorry about that. Anyway, so some know. of the recent books, my, my parents. My parents open carry. Mama voted for Obama. Help mum, there are liberals under my bed. Donald drains the swamp. And then here we've got a book, my, Why Daddy is a Democrat. So Democrats make my schools have great teachers. And there's another one. Democrats give police officers and firefighters the tools they, um, I can't even read from you. Democrats make it feel better again. And, so, and, so, and not only that, you'll see articles, there's more articles being published. Um, in the, the Atlantic recently publi uh, published a book about the radicalization of bedtime stories. And you'll see more articles in The Guardian about A is for activism, um, exploring the role of children's books and politics. But anyway, so what I, I can kind of go on anyway. So the so storytellers and libraries have been passing on human knowledge for millennia, and the children book industry is relatively modern. And it's an interesting industry because the intended, the children, are totally absent. Children are dependent on adults to write, publish, buy, and read books to them. Children are not involved in the feedback loop. And so it's interesting because children's books actually end up telling us more about adults than they do about children. And when I'm referring to a children's book, I'm referring not, or, or a picture book, it's not just 
it's not just pictures. You know, there's pictures and lots of words. Okay? No, no, no. Just, just to clarify, it's not just pictures. And um, I want to go to my next slide. <laughs> Wait. I want to have the timeline here so you see the perspective. We've had storytelling for a long, long time, and it's always been joint, it's always been adults and children. <laughs> I could read a story too, I guess. <laughs> Take one, two. So, here we go, just go straight to slides, it's fine. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly review the history of children's books. Sorry, I'm using that Okay, all right. So today I'm going to briefly review the history of children's books and by proxy how adults' perceptions of children have changed over time. Then I want to describe the quality of children's book collections at our public libraries. And finally, I'd like to discuss changes the public can push for in our local libraries without resorting to central control. So Australia has uh, 1,408 libraries. They're un they come under local government and they cost over 1.2 billion annually. Um, here we go. So broadly speaking, broadly speaking, prior to the 18th century, children were mostly viewed as miniature adults. Much was expected of them and their childhoods were very, very short. The few children books published were very didactic, mostly about morals, manners, and they were heavily influenced by religion. Post 18th century, the philosophers, oh, here we go. Now help. Here we go. Uh, post 18th century, the philosophers Locke and Rousseau popularized the ideas that childhood was very special time for playing and learning, and books started to appear for children that instead of dictating, started encouraging how to develop a strong moral self, sense of self, and how to, and books to enjoy ABC and rhyming, and it all became a little bit more gentle towards the children. It was in the 18th and 19th centuries that, it was in the 18th and 19th centuries, reflecting the times, that children's books were mostly about travel and adventure, but even then, many books that were written for adults were greatly loved by children. There was a great cross fertilization. And then it was 100 years ago that the, and then it was 100 years ago that the children's picture book industry finally came into itself. And that was with the ability to mass produce in color, literacy rates became adequately extensive, and there was a, there was a large middle class who actually purchased the books. So since, this industry, since then, this industry has only grown and it's gotten to the point where it's the biggest it's ever been and the most differentiated. So children's books used to fall under one category. Today, it is broken up into various ages. And for each niche, publisher guidelines dictate to authors the number of words, pages, characters, and the extent of complex language and plot complexity that they can have. You know, it is a far cry from our history of sharing stories across the ages. And overall, by decreasing the cost of being able to publish a book, the average quality has come down. So despite more books out there for children than ever before, reading rates have dropped, and 75% of children will tell you that I would read more if I could find a better book. It's it's, it's like when TV went from four channels to 60. There are still great works, but far more mediocre material to have to sort through. So how do our public libraries manage these collections? Do they act democratically and give people what they want or, or think they need? Or are they curating collections to promote reading and an educated democracy? We homeschool and so we've spent um, for the last few years, we've spent quality time in about 10 different libraries in New South Wales and Queensland. And for this study, I interviewed librarians and staff from national and international organisations that informally 
connect libraries. Everyone I communicated with agreed that public libraries are now far more mainstream than they have ever been. The current trend of 21st century... Oh. Sorry about this. Changing, I'm changing. There we go. Just tell her. There we go. So the current trend for 21st century libraries is to have a bookstore style collection with a coffee shop vibe. And overall, less books to make more space for digital endeavours and creative purposes or maker spaces. And so, for example, the City of Sydney recommends that you visit the new Green Square Library. And the number one attraction is the architecture. Number two is the Baby Grand Piano, which has beautiful views and you can rent it out for practicing or a concert. Four, you can go and play with classic video game consoles. Or you can borrow a robotic or electronic kit. And Unfortunately, they've done this in the US, and it's quite sad because what, as the more comfortable they make these libraries and the more ser free services, kind of very passive services that they offer, the libraries end up just becoming de facto homeless shelters. And so we get to about number six, and then they encourage us to read a book. <laughs> and then... So... We'll get to, sorry about this, this is. But is a market-driven children's book collection and a slew of digital, digital devices the best our libraries have to offer for Australian children? Given our understanding of how critical early experiences are for children's brains and the role of sharing, sharing stories in human history, stewards of our libraries should be practicing the, 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 pro, pro, uh, the precautionary principle. Much evidence-based research, including elegant fMRI studies, show that reading aloud and storytelling to your children under five is correlated with cognitive advantages in relationship, academic and career success, as well as longevity, longevity and staying out of jail. But it is not just about reading any book. The key is for both parties to, to enjoy reading a wide variety of quality material. But. If you were to go into a children's section at a library today, you would, find out that the, you would find out that all the children's picture books are organized in tubs, and they're organized by the author's surname. So they may as well be sorted by size or color. The first lesson a child gets when they go to the library endorsed by the parent and the librarian is to judge a book by its cover. And this is a rule every adult will attempt to unteach the child for the rest of their education. Concerning the book, picture book, the, the picture books themselves, most are fiction and fall under the category whimsical or absurd. There are many formulaic books with talking animals and many redos of old stories. The language can be very emotive and extreme. You know, I hate everybody and, and I feel terrible and I'm so anxious and I'm so scared and I'm really, really scared about this and I don't want to go out up on the stage. And and then the other thing is, I'm so bored. And unfortunately, as most religions knew when they were writing their religion te religious texts, the children repeat these la la lines verbatim. The passive adult tone toward children today seems to be a mix of, condes uh, being of condescending and pandering, which is similar to what my other colleagues said today. Yeah, we know in the first year, a baby's brain doubles in size, and by two, the sensitive period for language and other higher cognitive function peaks. Adults need to raise their expectations. The language children hear and learn is what they are exposed to. Reading from a variety of sources, poetry, rhymes, science and history, expands their vocabulary. Each word doesn't have to be understood. What is being absorbed and becoming familiar is the sound of a well-structured sentence, jargon, cadence, tone, rhythm and inflection. Just so long as the reader is invested in the material and the child is not being spoken down to. Uh, to quote our well-renowned author, Mem Fox, many picture books are filled to the brim with cutesy pie sentiment or are about nothing at all. When it comes down to it, we turn the last page and think, well, so what? A so what book will put kids off, bo uh, kids off books and reading all together. When an adult enjoys reading, their voice and their character change. You know, a, a mask drops and children see another side to a parent or carer. They share an adventure that sparks new conversations and discussions. And the broader the material, the broader the conversations. 
Good books explore the dirty corners of life, of life as well as the dazzling lights. And what better way for your child to learn something about the harder sides of life than while safely snuggled on your lap with you ready to talk them through it. Storytelling and books have always played a role in st preparing student, students and children for life, allowing them to experience vicariously troubled realities like their own and different to theirs, and, and, and to feel emotions, to empathize, and to make judgments. So where does that leave our library system? Libraries are in the midst of an identity crisis and librarians are open to feedback and they show a great willingness to engage and meet the needs of their local communities. Though it is worth keeping in mind, libraries have prime real estate, they have credibility and they have big budgets. And so they naturally attract non-profits, consultants, businesses and people who want to tap into those budgets and seek influence. Therefore, the public need to do more than just tell the librarians what they want but ask the librarians for the data that justifies some of the major changes that they're now implementing. And we need to be able to remind the librarians of their strengths in the principles of data organization, classification, and books. Encourage them to readdress their principles with up-to-date research to meet the needs of young people. This is easy to say, but what does it look like? So firstly, Sorry about this. <coughs> Firstly, sort picture books into subject categories, not by the author's surname. This is what children under five are doing. They are trying to classify the world. And the most fundamental classification is, is it real or is it not? Fiction versus non-fiction. Non-fiction books need to make up 50% of the, of the collection, not less than 10% like now. And this will immediately support boys who are already reading less than girls and who prefer non-fiction. Second, in addition to fiction versus non-fiction, other subject categories could include classics, Australian, Australian books, poetry, biographies, and even a controversial and progressive section. Categories allow parents and librarians to encourage children to pick different styles of books. You know, just like with food, you want a balanced diet and it helps parents navigate so they can pick out material that is meaningful to them. Next, call picture books, picture books. Calling them children's picture books excludes older audiences and implies they are less serious than other books. Children pick up on this and it's not accurate. Other older readers are increasingly enjoying non-fiction picture books. Non-fiction has come a long way from the days of listing facts. Narrative non-fiction puts people, events, and ideas into context with illustrations. And when it's done well, it's very inspiring. Teachers in high school are reading them to teens as an introduction to a new topic and in an effort to get books across the curriculum instead of just English classes. Adults are using them for their own research as it is a great place to start to get an overview or to get the essence of a personality, an idea, or event. In the US recently, a contestant won Jeopardy and attributed his success to the research he completed in the children's nonfiction section. And so, the, oh, I apologize. I'm just, so these are some of the books, the narrative nonfiction. Um, there's some beautiful Australians ones here. This What's Your Story and The Day We Built the Bridge. It's nice to think that books have not just, not finished evolving just yet. Australia still needs, oh, excuse me. So the non-fiction pic, non pic, picture book industry, especially this narrative non-fiction, it, it, it's relatively new too. It got a boost in the US in 1957 with a Sputnik crisis, prompted the government to invest in children's books, and that has spurred on the non-fiction children book section ever since. And it's, it's, it's really nice to think that, the, um, that books are still evolving. There's still something out there to surprise us. And it, that libraries should be better off working on focusing on books and presenting them in new ways and in new light as the authors keep doing so. Australia does need more cross-fertilization of arts and sciences. Here, more people with arts backgrounds are likely to be employed in publishing and libraries. And this bias can narrow the focus, the audience, and the scope of thinking, highlighting again the need for data-driven justifications for major changes instead of just having a vision. Regarding embracing all that is digital, there is no justification for any digital devices in the children's section at all at the library. 
Programmers in Silicon Valley are not giving digital, digital devices to their children. An effort to, and efforts to teach programming with games and small robots, this is what's happening at the moment, Again, there is no evidence that any of these work. There's plenty of our children out there who play with Lego, Lego, and we still don't have enough engineers. Sadly, librarians are coming across as salespeople when they push children away from books to these gimmicks. And they're getting hoodwinked into buying these things, and the salespeople won't stop coming. Lastly, oh, where is it? So, so, um, so, so children don't need any coaxing or any help to get onto a computer. That, that, that will happen naturally. The, too, natural. too naturally. <laughs> so lastly, the, the librarian's commitment to decreasing the number of physical books, again, cannot be justified for children. Online book catalogues are a chore, and 79% of children say they want to read print books. Children learn best with their hands, and reading a physical book engages all five senses. By the same token, parents need to model reading a love of reading. But if an adult is on a digital, to digital, digital device, the child has no idea what they are doing. So adults and children have shared stories for all of human history. And when it comes to reading, don't underestimate your children and don't underestimate your books. And, and don't settle for poor books. Read widely and boldly with them. It is an easy activity, it benefits the brain, and, and it will seed a lifetime of conversations and intimate moments. And be sure to engage with your librarians and ask for data-driven justifications for any changes that they are currently making. Thank you.